Well, the title is Ushering in the Golden Era in the Information Age, so I'm very optimistic. But I'm not really that optimistic, because we'll only have it if we build it. And it's not so clear that we're going to build it. So we have to understand what a golden age is about. We have to understand how technological revolutions evolve to be able to say that perhaps there is a golden age ahead and relatively soon. Well, I have a first question. Do you people think that finance, that innovative finance, disruptive finance will just be a niche next to the, in a world of financial dinosaurs? Uh, do you think the context affects your chances of success? Is it important for you to see the big picture? Well, I'm going to try to talk to you about the big picture, and you've spent the whole day talking about your space. It's big enough, of course, but it's like a slice. And now I want to talk about the whole big picture, which means the man and all the other industries and, and which countries are going to grow. I mean, really look at the whole thing. Do you think it's important for you? Do you think you need to try to glean the global future? And should you even try to influence it? I understand you people are growing very fast. There are more and more of you and there are more and more successful ones. So maybe you have more power than you think. But anyway, do you think so? Do you think you could influence the future? Now what history tells us is that we are now, at this very moment, after the huge bubble collapse, we are at a critical time of transition when the future is being shaped both by our, by our actions and by our by our inaction. You know what? The easiest way to make a mistake about the future is to think it will be like the recent past. Imagine somebody in 2006 saying, which they did, you know, we're now in the great moderation, this is going on forever, and then plop, huge collapse. And now we're five, six years into something completely different. And the same thing, imagine in the 1930s, somebody saying, we're going to have two whole decades of huge boom with workers, with houses and, and automobiles at the door, and it's going to be a fantastic boom. Of course, you couldn't predict the war, and you couldn't predict that either. But there is a lot that we can learn if we understand technological revolutions. We really need to see how they are driven, how they shape and are shaped by society and the economy. I want to tell you that the ICT revolution can bring a golden age, but only if we build it. Now, first of all, let's look at the whole, at the five technological revolutions that we've gone through in 240 years. The first one, well, was the Industrial Revolution in England, 1771, machines, factories, canals. Canals were the internet of the time. Then we go to the next revolution from about 1829-30, that's the age of steam, coal, iron, and railways. Guess which was the internet of the time? Railways. Then in 1875, we have another huge revolution, the age of steel and heavy engineering, electrical, chemical, civil, naval. That was the time when the Southern Hemisphere was incorporated into the first globalization. And the reason why that was is because steamships replaced sailing ships. And therefore, instead of three months, it took three weeks. So you could bring meat and wheat and so on with ice in the, in the bowel of the ship. So that was a huge change, and that was the first globalization. The next one was the age of the automobile, beginning with Ford's Model T in 1908, of oil, petrochemicals, lots of plastics, and mass production. And our current revolution, 
from 1971 with Intel's microprocessor, we have the age of information technology and telecommunications. Now it's very important to notice that that arrow is only halfway because my whole argument is going to be about that we have only seen the first half of the ICT revolution. We still have the second one. The first one is concentrated in ICT. The second one is spreading across the whole economy and hopefully the whole world as it has already begun to be. Now, Sean has made an interesting interpretation of what this revolution means. He sees it not only as the fifth of this series, but as the first of a new series. And I would say that he's probably right, because I think that the next one is going to be the age of biotech, bioelectronics, nanotech, and new materials, maybe in 20, 25 years or so. But that's an information revolution. What's biotech? It's information handling. It's information processing. What's nanotech? What's new materials? It's all about a new way. It's not just industry, as in the past, sort of working the physical things. We're working inside with information, understanding how things work with information. So that we are in this hinge, but still, at this very moment, we are halfway across this particular ICT revolution. Now, each of these revolutions drives a great surge of development. So in fact, the whole or part of the globe depends which, which of the revolutions, how far it extends. But it actually brings a huge surge in productivity and shapes innovation for several decades. But you might ask, why call them revolutions? I mean, there are so many fantastic things that happen. How can we really identify that there is such a thing as a revolution? It's because they transform the whole economy. It's not just one little thing happening in one side. It's about transforming everything. We get on the one hand new industries, and on the other, a new paradigm a new paradigm for all. So we have, on the one hand, new dynamic industries and infrastructures with increasing productivity and decreasing costs. And that's explosive growth, structural change, and that's what everybody sees. But not everybody realizes that at the same time, there is something almost more important happening, which is that those new technologies affect everybody else. They become generic, all-purpose. Their infrastructures, in this case, of course, the internet, the organizational principles, all together are capable of modernizing all the existing industries. And not only that, they provide a quantum jump in innovation and productivity potential for all industries and activities, and that includes government. And up to now, governments have not understood how much they think they just have to add computers. They don't understand that it's a completely new world and they've got to transform themselves, just as the previous governments copied the Sloan model and the Ford model and everything. I mean, that's what the old governments are. And we still have them, the same ones. Like, we also have some companies that continue to be dinosaurs. So what happens is that we have a change in the direction of change, a change in the direction of change for all sectors. It's a radical transformation of managerial common sense that takes a long time to propagate. Imagine, we began in 71 and we're still spreading. Of course, digital natives realize that the others haven't changed. That's the huge difference. And one of the reasons why technological revolutions take so long to propagate is because some of us are not capable to follow some of you. The really new people who are born into the new technologies, they want to go fast. Some of us want to stop them because conservatism is a natural force. I mean, we've lived in the old paradigm, so it's very difficult to switch your head and to give up some of your experience. Now, 
I know you have seen a thousand before and after how it used to be and how it'll be, so I'm sorry, I'm going to give you another little list of before and after. So what's some of the elements of the paradigm shift that's been taking place since the 70s? From rigid mass production to flexible production, which doesn't mean no volume, much greater volume, but flexible. Closed pyramids to open networks, from stable routines to continuous improvement, you know, five-year plans and manuals, from human resources to human capital, which means that talent, knowledge, intelligence create value more perhaps sometimes than actually having the machines or human resources attached to them. Suppliers and clients are now value network partners. We go from fixed plans to flexible strategies, so you go and see and people are empowered to change as long as they have a direction. From three-tier markets to a huge hyper-segmentation that goes from the most standard through the bespoke to long tail, you know, the whole lot. From supply push innovation, you can have any color as long as it's black, like Ford said, to demand pull innovation, what do you want? From internationalization, so each nation had its little economy, closed economy, and then there was trade between them, to globalization where the economy moves freely, the territories have to shape the space where people go. From neglect of the environment to the environment as a challenge, and from information as a burden to information as an asset. So it's a new common sense that's enabled by different technologies. Such profound changes confront resistance and break each diffusion process in two. If we look at the degree of diffusion of each technological revolution, and we see it as an epidemic curve, which is how all technologies diffuse, either each product or, each, or the whole lot, each revolution goes from gestation to exhaustion, but it goes through two different periods. The installation period, which is the one we have already lived, where we learn the paradigm and the whole thing, and the deployment period, which is when it spreads to the whole of the economic space. And it so happens that there are two different prosperities in each. One is the bubble, the Gilded Age, and the other, the Golden Age, on the two sides of the recession that the bubble collapsed provokes. So in the installation period, it's financial capital that's at the helm because it can force paradigm diffusion. It can identify the winners in unfettered markets. But in that time, we have income and demand polarization, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. Whereas in the golden age, it's production capital that takes over and it's aided by the state and supported by innovative finance, finance that works for that new production world. And it is a time when you have better distribution of income and better distribution of demand. So it's socially more sort of egalitarian or fairer or whatever, whereas the installation period has a lot of social tensions. So we have from Big Bang to Big Bang, we have those two periods. And in between, we have, after the collapse, recessions, uncertainty, and the role shift that should happen, but might not happen this time. Perhaps big finance is too powerful to allow the necessary change, and that would mean that it's much more difficult to get the golden age. But anyway, that is the situation we're living now. We're in a transition that will define which way of all the range of the possible we're going to go. We are there. And the major crash and the crisis mark the swing of the pendulum. Once the technology is exhausted, the pendulum swings back and finance has to come back for the next technological revolution. Let's then look at what I've been telling you, but with dates the historical record, how, how, why can I say that that's how it's happened? 
these bubble prosperities, recessions, and golden ages. OK, we take the five great surges, two in Great Britain, one Britain, USA, Germany battling for the hegemony. USA takes over for the next two. And who knows who will be for the next one. So we have our installation, deployment, and turning point, our bubble prosperities, collapses, golden age, and maturity. So the first one, we had the Canal Mania, then the Canal Panic, a few years, and then the Great British Leap. The Railway Mania, Railway Panic, a couple of years, and the Victorian Boom. The bubbles of the first globalization, which actually happened in Australia, Argentina, in the Southern Hemisphere. And then after that, about four or five years, we had the Belle Epoque in Europe and the Progressive Era in the USA. Then the Roaring Twenties, the Panic of 29, and then the post-war Golden Age. And now we just had the Internet uh, mania and the Financial Casino. In fact, this time we had two booms, two bubbles, and two collapses. And I don't know, you people might know better, but I feel there might be another bubble cooking. So whatever. We only move to the golden age when we really get out of the recessionary period and of the casino. Those are the two things that, that make it gilded rather than golden age and, and makes it um, impossible for the paradigm to express itself in all its power. <clears throat> so will we now have a global sustainable golden age? Well, it's up to all of us. The shift from financial mania and collapse to golden ages is enabled by institutional innovation, including government, to shape and widen markets. So there is a lot of innovation yet to be made on the institutional side. There is much more innovation going on in, in the production side and in the financial side than in institutions. Now, one way of distinguishing between Gilded and Golden Ages is precisely the pendular polarization of income and its reversal. If we look, you know, the 99% and all this thing, this is the graph of the 90%. The income share of the top 10% of US taxpayers from 1917 to 2010, so from, from the fourth surge to this surge. As you can see, the top 10% had 50% of income in the 1920s before the crash, and they have 50% of income now. But the interesting thing is that that came down quite a bit when we are in the golden age, in the post-war golden age, to about 33, 34%. It doesn't mean that they had less money. It just means that there was much more to go around, and it went around much more evenly. So that is the installation of the fourth, the turning point of the fourth, the deployment period of the golden age, so you see polarization and reversal, then the installation period of the current surge, polarization again, and the question is whether at this turning point we will start going on reversal. Of course, the shift requires consensus on policy innovation, because that's the context that allows the man to be spread and production and innovation to be spread. Now, the technologies and policy innovations that drove and shaped the post-war golden age were, first of all, the innovation enablers for mass production, which are those. Cheap oil, cheap plastics, cheap materials, and cheap universal electricity, plus road and airway networks. So this was a great range of both resources and infrastructures that were very cheap. Then we have the demand, volume, and profile trends. We have the welfare state, the labor unions, public procurement, the credit system, including Fannie Mae at the time, because in order to have workers be able to buy a suburban house and fill, put a car at the door and fill it with electrical appliances, you needed to guarantee that they could actually take a mortgage. So if you could guarantee, and that's what generally was done, if you could give unemployment insurance, so if ever there was two, three months, four months, or whatever without a job, they could still pay, 
And if you could have pensions so that people were willing to spend their whole income because they knew that at the end they were okay, well, then demand was as much as possible. And if labor unions help increase with productivity, increase the um, salaries with productivity, then you had everything there for that. But that was the organization for that type of for that set of technologies, it isn't necessarily the one that's needed now. We've got to think which one is needed now. But the other thing that's important is what gives a direction for innovation. You need a specific demand that you are sure that's going to grow, that's going to be there, so you don't freeze, you're not frightened, you're not, you don't find it's risky because that is an obvious demand. Now, what made that demand? suburbanization, so you could have cheap houses on cheap land, not expensive cities, not isolated countryside, but cheap houses on cheap land with cheap cars and so on, the whole lot, the whole possibility. So suburbanization was crucial. Post-war reconstruction, which meant that there were capital goods, you know, everything, equipment for Europe, and the Cold War, of course which allowed a whole range of innovations, cutting edge innovations, and they were all guaranteed by these three phenomena. So as you see, we have technological enablers, demand volume growing, and specific direction of demand. So with all those things, together with finance abandoning the casino and innovating for the needs of growth and consumption, we had a very happy boom. It was, in fact, a positive sum game among business strategies, government policies, and consumer values. And it worked very nicely until the whole paradigm was exhausted. Uh, the energy crisis raised the prices of cheap energy. It was no longer cheap. Then it became cheap again. But at that point, it broke. And it was necessary for a new revolution to come along. So finance and the whole thing came along and the next revolution came. But that positive sum game brought the greatest boom in history. We are now in a different paradigm with a very different technological potential and a challenging environmental legacy requiring a different demand opportunity space. Every industry is now capable of innovating in multiple directions with the aid of, us, of ICT. In which direction to innovate? Everybody's frightened. Most of finance is frozen. Part of the reason why they're not funding the real economy is because they cannot be sure it's going to be profitable. They cannot be sure demand will be there. They cannot be sure of anything. So they'd rather continue in the little casino. It's much safer to go in the casino than to risk all these crazy innovators who don't even know who they're going to sell to. So profits are uncertain unless they all converge in similar directions and create synergies, like suburbanization, Cold War, which I just told you. So, could we unleash an ICT-driven global golden age for the 21st century? Could it do for the world population what the previous one did for the advanced countries of the West without losing the gains, because that would be really sad. If we manage to get all these, China, all the BRICS, all the Africa, the whole lot, everybody growing fantastic, three billion new consumers, how about, how about back home? Do we think it's okay for these countries to decline and just go off and do things for the Africans and the Asians and all the rest? Or should we find a way of getting them to work together? Should we find a positive sum game between all? Well, yes, we could have a golden age. And we could have it in such a way that it, it will be good for everybody. But it will require massive institutional innovation. We have to take the whole tax system and rip it to pieces and change it completely. We have almost every single one of the mass production regulations are wrong. They're old, they're obsolete, they're useless, they're an obstacle, they don't work. They don't have anything to do with the present reality. So we've got to change. Intelligent policies, local, national, and supranational. You all know very well, finance is supranational. How could you try to 
rein it in from the little national spaces, no matter how powerful. So, but it has to be intelligent, not stupid. So if it were going to be supranational, it's got to be really good. And we also need innovative finance serving the real economy and the clear consensus direction for innovation and investment, I say again. Therefore, we're talking about a new positive sum game, as before, between business, government, and society, but also between advanced and advancing countries. It's got to be good for both. So is there? a combination of factors and elements that could give us a viable global positive sum game. I propose to you that if we can have universal low-cost ICT, full global development as the volume of demand, and green growth as the direction of innovation, then we can probably do it. Revamping transport, energy, products, production systems, and lifestyles to make them sustainable is equivalent to post-war reconstruction, the Cold War, and suburbanization as synergistic guides for innovation. Incorporating successive new regions and millions of people into sustainable consumption patterns is equivalent to the welfare state and government procurement in terms of demand creation without planned obsolescence. We can have durable products, and it's fine. They can go 20, you know, if they're really durable, they can go to 20, instead of one person consuming three or four times, three or four refrigeration, refrigerators in a lifetime, you can have one refrigerator serving 20 people. You can have a rental system. You can have millions of people employed in maintenance. I mean, there is a completely different world when you think of durable products. And then, with universal low-cost ICT, full internet access at low cost is equivalent to cheap fuels, cheap electricity, and plastics in facilitating demand, innovation, and this time, also education. And it's the education of the consumer as prosumer, and also just learning to have capacity value to... I, you know, this insistence on it should be cheap. I would like to show you how it worked before. Growth, demand, and innovation were aided in the previous golden age of the oil, the automobile, and mass production by cheap, cheaper electricity and fuels and all the rest. Here is what happened between 1926, which is like the middle of, say, the equivalent of the 1990s for us, and 1970, which is the beginning of the exhaustion of that age. Well, what you see rising there is the general price index in the USA. And is what you see descending is the price of electricity. That is the amount of times that electricity became cheaper than everything else. So you didn't think of it. It was too cheap to worry about, and therefore anybody who could invent some electric thing that you could plug made of plastic with a little something, that was something that you could sell because it didn't cost much to operate and because it was cheap to begin with. So cheap and cheaper universal access to internet would do the same for a global golden era. Now I want to just do another little bit about the shifting from different paradigms giving different golden ages. <coughs> The mass production golden age compared to a possible ICT golden age, if we look at innovation focus, the family unit, thank you, the family unit in the suburban home was a factory where you cooked and washed and everything with machines. In fact, women learned, what, what, during the war, women learned to use machines for production, so then when they came home, it was very easy for them to accept all these machines. So it was a factory and it was an entertainment center. You had your TV, your radio, your, your record player, and then you know each of the changes to the future. But the whole thing and your, even your barbecue, you know, the whole range of things you were supposed to, you were making for the home. You turned services into products. The Cold War and the space race gave you another direction. What is the innovation focus today? What could it be for the golden age? The mobile individual, not the family unit. 
in multiple networks, including the family, learning, creating, connecting. Now you're going to turn products into services. And we need a sustainable infrastructure for the world. Can you imagine the amount of innovation? I'm not just talking about energy, alternative energies or whatever energies. The whole range of things that are needed for producing across the world. Now, what's the planet for this golden age? Well, in the past, it was a source of energy and materials, a waste dump, cheap hydrocarbons as only movers, and a huge divide between rich and poor countries. The, one of the main characteristics was this whole thing about first world and third world. Now we have a complex system to be understood and protected. It's our common home. Productivity of resources can increase exponentially, should be made to increase exponentially. That's the new space race, really, because we don't have. I mean, can you imagine all the Chinese having the American way of life? It's just impossible. We don't have seven planets, so we've got to invent a fantastically wonderful way of life so that everybody wants it. And as soon as possible, because otherwise we'll reach limits. And global well-being, so every country can grow, lifting all boats. So it's markets for everybody. And what's the good life? Well, it used to be a question of quantity. Maximum possessions disposed of to get new ones. Comfort has goal. Couch potatoes passive pleasures, lots of food and obesity as a result, and travel as holiday. So you got away from life by traveling. Now it's a question of quality and meaning. That's the good life. Optimal possessions, durable, upgradable, or exchangeable. Active and creative pleasures, lots of exercise and going up mountains and J um, uh, jumping from bungees and all those things that the young people do and we are all horrified but, but it is wonderful for you isn't it organic healthy gourmet foods travel as experience both real and virtual so we're actually going I mean it's quite a change and it's not going to happen from one day to the other but if it doesn't happen we're not having a golden age We've got to change the lifestyles profoundly, what people aspire to, the luxury life. Such major changes of lifestyle have happened in each deployment period as the new technologies provide a new different set of affordable goods and services. So in the age of steam, coal, iron and railways, we had an urban industry-based Victorian living in Britain only, because that's the only country that really, with a bit of Belgium, that really had a proper deployment period because it had advanced. The next one was a bit wider. So in, the first, in that first globalization, we had an urban cosmopolitan, precisely because it was globalized, so people were traveling, a lifestyle of the Belle Epoque in Europe and the US. Then we had the age of the automobile oil and mass production, and of course we have the suburban energy intensive American way of life. Now each of these became the good life. It redefined people's desires and guided innovation trajectories. Now we have our own age of global ICT. Will the developed and emerging countries develop a variety of ICT intensive and local sustainable lifestyles? I really believe that the very fact that for every product we tend to have a long tail, <clears throat> a variety that caters to different people, I think gradually the world could be moving to something which is like uh, mass customization. So you have some things that are common. Everybody's going to have ICT more or less the same. But what you put on top of that, the style of living, the things you do, you know, today you go into any city and you look up and you don't know which city you're in because the buildings are the same, the things, and even you see McDonald's and you see, I mean, even the shops. So we have this very flat, everything the same. We'll have part of that, but I think more and more we might be having something else. I don't know, maybe not. 
Is this utopian or is it realistic? Well, I know it sounds utopian, but it also sounded utopian to say in mid-1930s depression that blue-collar workers will have lifetime jobs and fully equipped suburban houses with a car at the door. Well, increasing wages created many more millions of consumers for mass production and sustained growth when that happened. To say that most colonies will gain independence? You're crazy in the 30s when, when Hitler was organizing to have more colonies even inside Europe and also in Africa and all the rest? Well, it happened. Practically every country became independent and the rising middle classes in the developing world adopted the American way of life, widening world markets for mass production for everybody. Or imagine in the late 60s, somebody saying, some of the values of that hippie movement, you know, like back to natural materials, organic food, etc., they're going to become the luxury norms. Ha ha! The luxury norms, those dirty guys. Well, innovation in natural textile fibers have transformed the world of fashion. And innovation in distribution logistics have made organic foods the premium segment in supermarkets. So they did become the luxury norms. So shifts in consumption patterns shift profit-making opportunities. So does innovative finance have a role to play in all this? It is already helping in the right direction. It's moving finance away from the self-serving casino and towards supporting the users, redesigning finance with the new paradigm. That's great. But regulation is still being shaped by the dinosaurs and big finance and government. Could, should disruptive finance design intelligent regulation and policies to help modernize government? Somebody's got to do it. And whoever is going to do it has got to know enough about finance to know what will work and what won't. So I'd say that the golden age lies ahead as a possible future. We need to build consensus for an adequate institutional framework nationally and globally. We must move investment and innovation out of casino finance and into production and the real economy. It is the responsibility of this generation, the one that played Nintendo, not mine, but all of us who are alive today, to make sure the opportunity does not pass us by. Thank you.